Hey, welcome everybody. Craig Gordon here with the Utah Avalanche Center. Thanks for joining me tonight. We're streaming live. We're from backcountry.com's corporate headquarters. We're right here in Park City, Utah. And I want to thank backcountry.com, of course, for all their amazing support throughout the years. As a matter of fact, here's a factoid for you. 15 years ago, backcountry.com was one of the initial partners that helped to plant the seed money for the wildly popular, amazingly successful Know Before You Go program. So as you know, that is not only a national program, it's an international program. It's uh, in other galaxies, it's seen. So we're reaching a lot of people. We're saving a lot of lives. As always, thanks to backcountry.com for that initial support and plus what we're doing here tonight. So here's where the rubber hits the road for uh, some ongoing support we're giving away a free AVI Level 1. What you want to do is check the comments below. Operators are standing by. We're taking your orders, and we're going to make this happen for somebody tonight. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a deep dive into the last installment of this three-part series. So we talked about um, going into more of a preseason tune-up, what we do as professionals. And I'm going to share that with you because I recreate in the backcountry as well. So I want to uh, kind of keep things going as the season develops. You've taken a no before you go class, right? So you've got some basic heavy education under your belt, and that's good, but that's just the first step. And what we want to do is make sure that you continue that education. So of course, visit kbyg.com, and excuse me, kbyg.org. Uh, take an e-learning class, kind of continue that, that same vibe throughout uh, the winter. You'll want to take one of those e-learning classes. And then we've got a great event uh, that's hosted here November 10th, 11th, 12th. And that's going to be a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night. It is the 13th Annual Utah Snow and Avalanche Workshop, or USAW, from 6.30 to 9 p.m. After that, get some on-the-snow training. Enroll in one of our Backcountry 101s. But in the meantime, you've got the gear, right? You've got uh, Beacon, you've got Shovel, you've got Pro. You've been practicing with this stuff, and you've been practicing often. And that's really good because you got to know how to use all of this rescue gear. But here is your buzzkill disclaimer. is that if you got to use this stuff, it means that you've screwed up. You've made a mistake, you've triggered an avalanche, and now you've got to go find your buried partner. And what we've got to remember, here's the bottom line, right out of the gates. We trigger a slide, a quarter of us who trigger a slide, we're caught, we're carried. We're going to get slammed through trees, carried over cliffs, popped into rock bands. So a quarter of us die just from trauma. For the rest of us, you know, we've got a 90% chance of being found by our partner, but it's going to be in a very small window of time. We got to use the rescue gear. Well, it means that we screwed up, right? I don't want to screw up. I want to have a great day. I want to get home to my family at the end of the day. Hugs, kisses, high fives, right? At the trailhead. That's how we want to roll. OK, great. We got that out of the way. So while we're waiting for the snow to fly, what are going to be the couple of things that we want to do? Well, we want to get into the snow and avalanche mantra. We want to get our brains kind of dialed in and start thinking about snow, starting thinking about avalanches, start thinking about weather. What's the one best place I can go? Well, if I'm into reading, I'm going to pick up Bruce Tremper's book and Staying Alive in Avalanche Train. It's sort of like an enjoyable avalanche boot camp, right? It's something that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to volunteer for. I'm going to read through it, and it's laid out precisely. Bruce, uh, mentor to so many of us here in the Wasatch and beyond, lays out a compelling book, great framework to keep us on top of the greatest snow on earth, as we say here in Utah. If you're looking just for some avalanche-related stories from avalanche professionals, search and rescue folks, guides, climbers, and then some stories of things that went a little sideways with maybe some not-so-happy endings, Check out a new book that I uh, helped out with and Ed Powers, um, and that's um, Avalanche Dragons in, in the Snow. So check that out, and both of these are available through the Mountaineers. We're getting all of that together, and now I want to think also, how am I going to communicate with my partners, and how skilled are they not only with their avalanche rescue gear, but also how about their first aid skills, right? 
So basic first aid skills, kind of wrap your brains around some of those things. Take a woofer class. Make sure everybody in your crew has got your back. Part of having your back too is how are we gonna communicate? Let's get some good comms on board as well, all right? Let's think about always reevaluating from the time that we get up and we have that massively strong cup of coffee till we roll into the rig, we're talking to our crew on the drive up and then reevaluating at the trailhead. So everything is always a reevaluation. Um, my early season approach, how does it work? Well, it works the same as it works mid season as it does late season. It works the same whether I'm out forecasting or whether I'm out for a day recreating with my friends. What it revolves around is the avalanche triangle. And what that has to do is it's got weather in it, it's got snowpack, it's got terrain, and in the middle of it is us, is people. I'm gonna look at all of this and I'm gonna think out of all of these elements, what do I have control of and what do I absolutely have no influence on? So let's start there. I'm gonna look at weather because I've got no influence of the weather and that's sort of where everything starts. I start looking at developing weather patterns, particularly early season. And as I'm looking at those weather patterns, I'm gonna think, well, what we know right here in Utah, it's been pretty dry. Yeah, we've had a couple of teaser storms, but nothing that's really setting us up for number one, to get out and ride, and secondly, Nothing right now is really setting us up for any dangerous layers in the snowpack. So that's the good news. But what I can do sometimes is I know it's been stormy and I know it's been stormy to the north of us. Yeah, Montana's getting storms. They're getting avalanches. Wyoming's getting storms. They're seeing riding. They're getting avalanches. So what I can do is a little bit of a nearest neighbor approach. And what does that look like? I'm going to check out their avi advisories, uh, avalanche.org track their snowpack, see what's going on there. Are there any close calls? Are there any accidents? Is there anything that I can learn? If it's all green light and it's good to go, maybe I uh, pack up my road trip and mobile and I'm gonna head up there. We're gonna do a road trip and you know maybe we just head into that zone and get some early season turns. So what I wanna look at though is maybe when that weather pattern starts to change, what it looks like for my zone, particularly here in Utah, are these northern or central or southern um, track influence kinds of storms? Kind of track things around. And again, the nearest neighbor thing, we can learn a lot even if we're not planning on riding in that zone. Nonetheless, we're still getting information and we're starting to get more into that avalanche mantra. We're wrapping our brains around that. Let's look at another thing that I have no influence of, right? And that's snowpack. Man, the most technical part of this whole gig is snowpack. And early season, I asked myself, well, the first thing is, where is the snow? Where's that pre-existing snow? One way I can do that, maybe I'm out hiking, I'm out for a trail run. Not only am I taking a mental map, I might also be taking my phone out and taking a couple of pictures. It's easy and it can save your life. And I'll tell you why that's important. First off, as we're starting into a pre-season um, kind of state of mind, once it starts snowing, where do we generally head? We generally head into those zones that had pre-existing snow, right? So maybe that had old October snow or maybe even old September snow because we're gonna migrate to those areas where the slopes are the whitest. Now, here's the problem. Uh, well, first of all, it makes sense, right? Because uh, we don't wanna be slamming into rocks or stumps or deadfall or something like that. So we're gonna kind of be steered towards where you know the mountains seem the whitest. Over time though, what we've gotta think about, especially if we go long periods of time without any snow, that snow near the ground, that pre-existing snow, well, it grows weak and it grows sugary. And, uh, and if, of course you're wondering, like how does it grow weak and sugary? You know, well, what we wanna think about is the snowpack is a lot like an insulating layer. So let, let's take this scenario. We're headed out, um, we're in the mountains, we're getting cold, right? And it's getting dark. Are we gonna start reaching for thin little cotton t-shirts and start sliding those on. Well, what we're gonna realize is that pretty quickly, we're losing all our body heat and that cold is penetrating those thin layers of cotton, right? 
If we want to insulate ourselves, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to grab some thick polypro. We're going to put some of those layers on and maybe throw on a nice uh, fat puffy, right? Nice, thick, insulating layers. And oh, now we're talking mm, warm and insulating, right? Just like the snowpack. The snowpack likes warmth. One of those ways that we can get a warm snowpack is with a nice deep snowpack with lots of nice, heavy, thick snow. So we want to stay in the warm just like the, just like the snowpack does. And the way that we create that is with consistent storms, storm after storm after storm after storm. And what happens is that that tends to grow a nice, deep, strong snowpack. And that combo often trends towards stability. So that's the good news. Um, so when there's no snow on the ground, the ground is just bare, it's got nice warm ground, and then the winter switch gets turned on, boom, and it keeps on snowing for a couple weeks or a month, maybe some little breaks in between, that's a designer snowpack. That's really what we want. We might be super anxious, jonesing for some freshies, stoked once it starts snowing, but once it turns off, especially here in the Intermountain West, that's when we develop these weak layers of snow. That's when things are sketchy. So having a little patience, man, it is really the name of the game in this business. And if it stretches out into second or third week of November, the winter switch gets flipped on and it keeps snowing, that's a good thing. It's a rarity around here, but it does happen. If you remember 2016, 17, it was just like that. We go from no snow to 100 inch base, right? From zero to hero. That's the way we want it. That's what we want to see. But usually what happens, let me bring you back to earth here. Let's talk seriously for a moment. What usually happens is we get a couple early season storms. It dries out. And in between those storm cycles, the snow tends to get sugary. It gets weak. It's what we call faceted snow. So what happens with those sugary faceted crystals? Well, once they get buried by um, storms that eventually roll in, we have these persistent weaknesses in the snowpack. And we forget all about them, right? Snowpack man has an amazing memory. And remember, anything in the snowpack that's persistent, anything that we call a persistent weak layer, is gonna be no bueno in our snowpack because it takes a long time to heal. We might forget about these layers. These layers are growing weak. They're growing structurally challenged. Once winter really gets going, we start loading those things up. Think strong snow on weak snow, strong dense snow that I can barely put my hand on and in. And underneath that, there's weak sugary snow that my fist just goes, crushes right into bad combination, sort of like an upside down cake. The problem with that kind of layering, like we often see early in the winter, is that when we trigger a slide, oftentimes it breaks deeper, it breaks wider than we expect it to, and it breaks down to the ground. So it's gonna reveal all of those obstacles that are hidden just under that facade of shallow snow. So it's gonna reveal rocks and stumps, and it might reveal deadfall. It's gonna rake us through that. And that's why triggering an early season avalanche is super, super dangerous. Because remember that trauma thing I said just a few minutes ago? Yeah, that's how we get smoked right out of the gates. Maybe we're not killed, but maybe we blow a knee, blow a shoulder. And now we're looking down uh, the barrel of a season ending avalanche, right? No bueno again. So you're looking at your, at your screen here and you're saying, weak snow, man, what is weak snow? It all looks white to me. Yeah, it all looks white to me as well. But what weak snow is, Let's think of, think of weak sugary facets like dominoes, okay? Dominoes are sticking straight up out of, the, out, of, out of the snow like this. Those are our weak facets. Those are our persistent weak layers. And when we slowly add snow on top of that, maybe we add, you know, a thin little shallow slab. What's going to happen? Those dominoes, they're going to they're gonna creak a little bit, right? Maybe one or two of them will start to bend over, but they'll adjust over time. You know, they'll shift around. They'll get comfortable in their own skin. Let's add a rapid load to those dominoes that are sticking straight up. And we put a dense, heavy, strong slab on top. And now, man, 
It's sort of like stretching a rubber band out like this. And right here, there's all of this stored elastic energy, all of this strength. Strength is equal to, to uh, the strength of the snowpack is equal to the stress that we're applying. Let's overload that. We come along, we take a step, we collapse that slope, whoomph, all of those dominoes flip over, boom. Now the slab is shattering like a pane of glass. We have released all of that stored energy. The dominoes have flipped over, now we're staring down the barrel of a really scary avalanche. So we're off to the races. How does this all work? Well, think of it like having the rug pulled right out from underneath you. The thing I want to think about is when I have that set up, much like I do early season snowpack or whenever we have a persistent weakness, I want to think about not only the slopes that I plan to ride, but also the slopes that are adjacent and above me, the slopes that I'm connected to. Also, who's around me? Who's above me? Are we triggering avalanches from a distance? What is the AVI forecast saying and telling us for that day's hazard? Anytime we're uh, triggering avalanches from a distance or remotely, that is a huge red flag. We totally got to tone it down. We totally have to um, avoid the avalanche dragon. Remember that, especially here in Utah, most of the av early season avalanche accidents we see happen as the snowpack is starting to develop or if we have winters where we have below average total snowfalls. Okay, once we have a persistent weak layer, every time we load that thing up, it's gonna get cranky, it's gonna react. So we gotta be cognizant of that and we've gotta be aware. So remember, with that setup, we're thinking about what's up above us, who's up above us, what we're connected to. Early season snowpack, we've got that under our belts. Um, we gotta think about not only the snow, we're riding in, right? Nice, light, fresh, fluffy pow. We gotta think about the snow we're riding on. We've got those weaknesses underneath. They're super unpredictable. And the way I manage that is through avoidance. Of course, that is mostly going to be found on slopes facing the north half of the compass. That's where those sugary layers tend to grow here. Um, so how am I going to figure out what's north, what's south? Uh, aspect. I mentioned that just a moment ago. What does aspect mean? Aspect is which way the slope fa faces. So south aspect, south facing slope, north aspect, north facing slope, and then all of those quadrants in between. What can we use for a compass? Of course, we can use our phones. We can also use our phones as a clinometer. The same guy that makes this great map here, Steve Aquilas, um, map of the Wasatch that gives us all the names. Remember, we got the comms, we got the gear. We're gonna talk to each other. Let's also know the local names, the local vernacular. So pick one of these up, utahavalanchecenter.org. You can uh, find all of that and anything you need. Your one-stop shop for all things avalanche, right? So we take care of that. Steve has got this really killer app where you can site up slope angle. And remember, most avalanches, what kind of degree are they happening on? About 30 to 45 degrees. That's when we're in avalanche terrain, right? So know the aspect, know the slope angle. The good news here is that with snowpack, as the snowpack starts to get deeper, uh, eventually a lot of those persistent weaknesses, they start to get compressed, they start to get smaller and more compact. Over time, they heal. That's if we continue on a consistent storm track. So that's what we wanna, wanna look at and we wanna look for. So patience is the game. Patience is the game. Remember, if snowpack is always the structure, and the way we look at all of this professionally, I mean, I'm out, I've got my snow kit, I'm scribing things down, we're looking at things through, um, through a lens to see what kind of crystals and what those crystals are doing, if they're getting bigger, if they're getting smaller, you know, we're looking at all of this stuff, we're geeking out, right? But how can I really distill this, package it, and Use this information so I'm not always geeking out in a snow pit. Hey man, I'm out to make turns. I want to go out and ski. Well, the best thing to realize is that if snowpack structure is always the question, then terrain is always the answer. So remember, the things I have no control of, right? In the avalanche triangle. No control of weather, no control of snowpack. How about terrain? 
man, I can totally control the terrain. And this is the thing that I can manage my travels throughout the winter, especially during times of elevated hazard. So my biggest consideration, where's the avalanche dragon living? And my other biggest consideration is what does that avalanche dragon look like? Is it just some sort of little manageable uh, shallow soft slab, a wind drift? Or is it the type of slide that if I trigger it, the consequences are going to be devastating and I might not get back to my car, I might not get back to my family at the end of the day? So I want to think about if the avalanche dragon is living on a north aspect, remember that's going to be something facing the north half of the compass, or a shady slope. And I have the possibility of triggering an avalanche that breaks to the ground, a potential to kill me. Why would I even go into that terrain and go and pull on the dog's tail? I mean, that makes no sense. If I swing around onto other aspects, perhaps one's in the sun. Or perhaps I lose a little elevation where that avalanche dragon doesn't live. That gives me an exit strategy, gives me a place to go. It doesn't lock me into that terrain. I'm able to change my objectives. So remember, when I say aspect, I mean which way the slope is facing. So if the avalanche dragon is on a north-facing slope, why would I swim with those sharks if it doesn't exist on south-facing slopes? I mean, who doesn't want to crank out runs in the sun on a cold winter day, right? It always gives me an exit strategy. So let's look at trends and the way to track trends uh, with recent avalanche activity utahavalanchecenter.org, or any of the other um, avalanche centers throughout the country, avalanche.org, and you can find that um, and that information on any avalanche center website. Because the biggest clue to avalanches are other avalanches. And if I see or I'm hearing about avalanches that are occurring on the same kinds of slopes I want to ride on, they face the same way, they're the same elevation, they are uh, same slope angle. Boom, this is nature's biggest freebie, right? So why not just avoid that stuff altogether? Um, again, remember, things come around. They come full circle. The snowpack, especially on an average year or above average year, will eventually turn the corner. So we got to practice some patience. we got to avoid the slopes where the avalanche dragon lives. And then we've got to avoid the, the avalanche dragon altogether. So, the forecast is going to give you all of that um, bullseye key information. We've got weather. We've got snowpack. We've got terrain. Oh, yeah, what's right in the middle of that bullseye? Well, it's us. In nearly every avalanche accident, we're the ones that trigger the avalanche that catches, carries, and maybe kills us. So we've got a choice. We don't have to hide under the beds when it's snowing. We don't have to hide under the beds during times of elevated avalanche danger. What we do need to do, though, is that we've got to take that information. We've got to come up with a plan. We've got to come up with an exit strategy. Everybody on board in my crew has got to be you know, on, on the same level of thought. Um, we can't get locked into bagging an objective, because then we're not going to see clues. We're not going to hear those whoops. We're not going to take in all of that information. So that's what I want, is that this approach is going to not be a one-size-fits-all. We've decided where to go, and, and we're not turning back kind of uh, approach. We want plenty of exit strategies. And with that, let's think of what they might look like. First of all, once the resorts get rolling, the hardworking women and men of the ski patrol, I mean, they're knocking avalanches down before we even roll into the parking lot, right? So during times of high hazard, what a great way to go bang out some runs, right? Just go visit one of your local resorts where that reduced avalanche hazard, I mean, we can pretty much parlay all of that hard work into spinning laps. Okay, easy. How about if we're just strictly backcountry? Well, the first thing we're gonna be thinking about is early season riding. Remember, the first or the next thing you got to be thinking about is what is the uphill policy at the resort that I normally ride when the lifts are spinning? What is it like before they open? That's our responsibility, okay? We got to check that out. Uh, UtahAvalancheCenter.org, we've got all of those uh, Utah resort 
policies posted. So let's be responsible with that as a community. All right, we got a great thing here. So let's keep up that great work as, as a community. Remember though, inside the resort before they open, no avalanche reduction is, is taking place. So it's just like the backcountry. So we've got to have our backcountry game on, right? Beacon, shovels, probes, all the rescue gear. But remember, avoidance, that's the big ticket. Second, let's think about terrain as things start to spread out a little bit more. Let's think about managing our terrain and then let's think about what that snowpack structure might look like. That doesn't mean that we have to be out analyzing every crystal and grain in the, in the snowpack. We take care of that for you and we post plenty of that information on utahavalanchecenter.org. But the things I wanna be thinking about, especially as I start into an early season snowpack and start moving around in the mountains. Number one, where is the avalanche activity occurring? Um, am I able to trigger avalanches from a distance? Are things getting popped out up above me as we're moving around in the mountains? Think about not only your crew, but who's around you, who's adjacent to you, and who's above you. I mean, man, the place is getting loved to death, right? Um, also, exit strategies. What do those look like? Maybe that's simply switching aspect. Maybe that's going to a zone that had no old snow, no persistent weak layers. And maybe it's just losing a little elevation, going down canyon. Maybe it's taking advantage of the foothills when there's some kind of uh, weather anomaly where we get more snow in the foothills than we do in the mountains. So always have that exit strategy on board. Most important thing, and we're gonna keep this pretty brief tonight, the most important thing is that I want us all as a community to make solid decisions, to watch each other's backs, to get home safely to our families, okay? Patience is the big game in this. And the mountains, man, they're always gonna be there. The line that we wanna tag will always be there. It is a matter of going into the mountains, on the mountain's terms, getting to the car at the end of the day, high-fiving each other, air-hugging each other, air-kissing each other, whatever we're doing midwinter, and saying, you know, in reflection, we made solid decisions today. We weren't just rolling the dice. We're responsible to ourselves, to our families, to our communities. So let's think about these things collectively as a community. If you need anything from us, you need anything from our camp, you know where to find us. This is our passion, this is what we do. No one in the Utah Avi realm or staff or sphere will ever be too busy to answer a question. So that said, I look forward to seeing you out on the snow. I look forward to a continued relationship all winter long. See you on the trailhead utahavalanchecenter.org. Peace be with you and have a wonderful winter.